Okay, um, let's begin our discussion here, uh, session two, Women's History in a Global Context. Um, I'm Blair Hodges, I work at the Maxwell Institute as our public communications person. I do our podcast and, and other things. I uh, was really um, honored to be asked to chair this panel, this panel discussion. We're joined here with Lori Maffley Kipp. She's the, Arthur Al or the Archer Alexander Distinguished Professor at the John C. Danforth Center on Religion and Politics. She's also wrapping up her first stint with us at the Maxwell Institute as an affiliate faculty member. Her teaching and research focuses on African-American religions, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and, and other matters concerning intercultural contact. And um, thank you for being here with us, Lori. Uh, seated next to her is Hazel O'Brien. She's a sociologist and lecturer at the Waterford Institute of Technology. She researches religion in Ireland, minority identities, and community. Thank you for joining us. And on the end here, we have Tonalyn Rutherford. She's a faculty member at Brigham Young University in the Department of Religious Education, and her research focuses on religion and Latter-day Saint experience uh, in India. Um, and so we're glad to have you on the panel as well, talking about global, the global context of women's studies. Let's begin by talking about some of the assumptions. Uh, in fact, someone asked a question about this in the previous uh, panel, that religion is sort of on the decline today. This classic enlightenment narrative presents religious faith as a throwback to earlier stages of human evolution, and now science is casting off the shackles of, of an unenlightened past, and the sun is dawning and melting the ice of religion away, it's, and so on and so forth. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about that. Um, Tunnelin, do you want to begin by how a global context complicates that simple narrative of religion fading? Sure, sure. Yeah, so, um, well, particularly if you look at what's going on in the field of global Mormon studies right now. It is a vibrant field. Um, any of these uh, locations where there has been a chair of Mormon studies that has sprung up, for instance, Claremont Graduate University that I was able to benefit from, um, has started a global arm of their research development because you cannot talk about Latter-day Saint or Mormon experience without considering the global aspect. That's where the vibrancy is today, um, and that's where the, the growth is coming, and um, it just, you, you must confront that, so, yeah. Are there differences in, in different contexts, for example, like European religious faith? The cliche is that if you go to Germany, there are a lot of churches, and but they're not churches, they're like art museums and stuff. Like people aren't religious there. Right. Uh, but you go to South America or Central America, or these other places where religion is thought to be flourishing in different ways. So put it in this global context of you know religion being on the decline versus what we're seeing right. Right. around the world. Yeah. yeah. So definitely the, glo the global south is the um, Christianity and religion in general has changed its center of gravity and um, the growth is there. But I, in my, I, I served an LDS mission in Sweden and my children want to convince me that I learned the most useless language in the world, which was Swedish. But I'm convinced that it could be one of the most powerful languages to understand what's going on in Europe right now. In Sweden, missionaries that are there are encountering people from everywhere and religious identities from everywhere. And being able to understand the transnational nature of Mormonism and what's going on in these places where there is a, a seemingly lessening of religion for the North Americans or the Europeans, but, on the, but it's the, the diaspora from the global south that is, is, is changing the, the narrative of religion. So. And either of you can jump in on this yeah, as well. In fact, I'll, I'll redirect to Hazel. What are your thoughts about this? You're, you're in yeah, Ireland, so... I think it's so interesting listening to Tonin talk about Sweden there because I'm coming from a, a North European context. When I look at Ireland, Ireland is a, a really interesting case study for us um, in terms of secularization debates because Ireland seems to be booking the trend with regards to an assumption of secularization that as societies modernize, they're just inevitably going to become non-religious or less religious. In Ireland, there's a really complex thing going on where on one hand, the Catholic Church is declining as the historical dominant religion, um, but a, a large majority of people still self-identify as Catholic. 
uh, new religions are growing, religions that were never present in Ireland before in any numbers, Hinduism, Islam, are exploding, Pentecostalism, uh, various Orthodox, so that's exploding. But then you also have a huge increase in atheism, agnosticism, and those who identify with non-religion. And so for me, I think it's really interesting in a European context to try to understand what's going on there, because on one hand, Ireland seems to be becoming more secular. There has been a separation of church and state in more recent years. But then on the other hand, new religions are growing. And there are still a majority of people in Ireland who are self-identifying as religious, as spiritual, who say that God matters to them. So how do I make sense of that in a European context where we constantly get told this narrative of Europe is non-religious or is becoming non-religious? What I've found is that the story is much more complex than that. I think it goes back to what people like Daniela Villagere or Grace Davy have said, which is that it might not be that Europe is becoming non-religious, but it might just be that the nature of European religion is changing. And they've spoken a lot about religious transmission and tradition, and about how traditions get passed from one generation to another. They've both made arguments that as uh, these European societies modernize and change, that the ways in which traditions can get passed down become fragmented, they become ruptured. And so there is this really interesting process where new traditions get created. And that's the stuff that I find most fruitful with regards to studying LDS or anything else which is what are those new traditions? What is the, the change and the adaptation that happens in a modern, supposedly secular society where people are clearly still spiritual and clearly still religious, but they might just be doing it in a way that isn't recognizable in the traditional study of religion? That's what I think is really interesting. Another complicated layer to this is uh, violence against religious people or interreligious violence too. And we're seeing this um, in other countries, especially where minority religious figures are coming under, uh, under a lot of attack. Um, can you talk about that a little bit and how, in, in a, at a conference about women making history, what, what, can, uh, what can history bring to that kind of a context? Uh, studying religion is nice in a contemporary context and that can help um, decrease interreligious violence or violence against religious people. Yeah. What does history bring to that? I think it's a, an understanding of just how complex people's identities are. You know, we often try to tell really simple stories about religious conflict. We try to say, well, this is, you know, a conflict between this religious group and that religious group. But of course, when we look at it, we see that it's about far more than that. It's about history. It's about ethnicity. It's about race. It's about uh, politics. It's about the economy. Uh, it's a, uh, these days, it, it's about physical resources. You know, it's about so much more than just uh, a conflict between different religious groups. I'm really fearful of the simple story, you know, whether it's in religious studies or sociology or anywhere else. I think there is a tendency sometimes to just assume that a religious conflict is uh, ultimately about religion. And more often than not, it, it really isn't. Religion might just be the tool through which those conflicts can manifest themselves and give a justification for the ongoing conflict. Um, I definitely think that we should be, as scholars of religion, trying to tell the complex stories, which are harder, but are much more representative of people's actual lived realities, I think. Since you do sociology, have you seen a lot of tension between the kind of approaches that you would take to these questions? Oh, go ahead. Yeah, see if you can pick. Yeah, hold your microphone. Yeah. Um, thank you. Um, you're a sociologist. Do you see differences or tensions between the kind of work that you're doing and, and historians that aren't taking a more sociologically informed approach? So in other words, how is this working out in the academy? Like what kind of tensions come up in the academy when we're saying, what's the best way to look at this history and to look at how it applies to the present situation? Yeah, and I actually think it's so interesting just to look at the different biases that different disciplines have towards each other, actually, and it's been really interesting to be a sociologist this week in a history-orientated uh, forum. I guess I come into history thinking, oh, you know, historians don't tend to be all that critical, or they're not taking the contemporary context in, in terms of evaluating how they're analyzing the past, and I, I come at it with this sociology head on me. But then I meet people like I've met this week <laughs> who refute a lot of those stereotypes that I had about historians. And they are doing critical work and they are critiquing themselves and positioning themselves in their own writing and trying to comprehend a wider social context that in, in terms of the history that they produce. So it's actually been really interesting for me to reflect on that this week. 
But definitely, I think there is no doubt that sociology sort of tends to think, well, how much can we rely on history? You know, is history just, as I describe it, flat? Uh, does it just tell uh, a, a sort of a narrative story of, well, in 1847 this happened, and then in whatever this happened? Uh, whereas uh, I feel as though sometimes sociologists, perhaps incorrectly, think that that's not helpful or that's not useful, and they go back into the history and try to add a, a layer of analysis that maybe they feel isn't there. And I'm well aware that in a room of historians, of course, many historians will be like, but it is there. <laughs> uh, but I think it is one of those eternal conflicts, again, even between disciplines of how do we perceive each other? What work do we think that we are doing? As a sociologist, I definitely think that you have to use history. Uh, maybe you don't necessarily think that it's done the way that you would have done it, but don't we all feel like that about each other's work? Oh, well, if I did that project, I would have done it this way. But you know, you didn't. So you take the work that has been done and you make use of it to inform your own work and hopefully it becomes a richer body of work because it has been informed by the great scholarship that's gone before us. Yeah, to continue that, Laurie, I would like to hear you talk about the, the personal stakes that can get involved in being a historian. Uh, one of the criticisms that someone might make of a historian are stereotypes, is that they're just telling chronology about the past, right? And, and that's all well and good, but we have problems in the present that, that need to be addressed. So Laurie, what are your thoughts about that? And this kind of gets into the territory of public advocacy and activism versus history and tensions that crop up between those different exercises. Yeah, I mean, I can't imagine disconnecting those things. I mean, none of us do in our lives, right? Our, our, uh, we see the ways in our own country right now that people are invoking history um, to all kinds of ends. Um, it's extremely important to, um, not just to understand a narrative of the past, but to think about the way we look at the past itself. And um, although I'm a historian, not a sociologist, I mean, of course, the, the common lament is that sociologists don't know their history. Um, it's, 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 it's important to have those conversations to make sure that you're with people in other disciplines. I and mean, that's what's been, for me, so valuable this week is having those interdisciplinary um, points at which you know, I can be drawn back to the present and reflect on what history might reveal. And just one, let me just give one example, yeah, give if us, I could, give us um, in terms of gl global religion or global Mormonism in particular, because I'm, I'm writing now a survey of global Mormonism. And, um, you know, the, the history of Mormonism has so often been written as a history of an American church that now becomes a global church. Well, in fact, it was a global church at the very beginning, and the church in the 19th century was an immigrant church. That changes the way we think about this sort of triumphal narrative of you know, moving across, across the world, and I realize that's not the way that um, some other people might interpret it, but I think it's really important to see the ways in which the roots of globalism have been there from the very start and to change our understandings, understandings of history in order to fully comprehend um, sort of the ways in which that past is still inflecting the present. Yeah, so how would you then take that new narrative and apply it to questions or experiences that people are having today? I think an obvious avenue would be there's, there's a lot of tension about immigration and immigrants and, and this type of thing. What, what do these historical narratives bring to the table in these conversations? Oh gosh, lots of things. Um, I think, you know, it, it, it might change the way we think about um, questions of the, the, uh, the ways that the church has had to, um, to respond to sort of outsiders over time, as you're saying, sort of the, not just the immigrants, but also keeping in touch with people in other places. Because there are a lot of people, um, because of lack of resources or because they were old or because they were sick, couldn't leave where they were. So there have been you know, members of the church uh, abroad all the way along. Um, but I think now it's, there are certain tensions within the church over globalization now that we're thinking are just new. And certainly the scale of it is different now, but the issues aren't new. Um, there are many ways in which you know, the church throughout the 19th century had to deal with language problems and with you know, what it, should we be able to have a Swedish ward, uh, you know, in, in Utah or a Danish ward? So those kinds of issues, I think we, we can, the, the past can shed a lot of light on um, maybe new avenues in the future. Do either of you have, yeah, please. I just yeah, wanted please. to add, um, talking about interdisciplinary 
the oral historians in this room, just raise your hand if you've worked on an oral history project. I mean, you can see that it's, it, that's an important aspect and we're working with sociological and anthropological tools in, in doing that, but we're creating archives, right? And it, the need for each other, I think about the principle of Anakantavada in Jainism, many fold aspects that we need. It's like looking at the elephant, right? All the blind men looking at the elephant. And we need these different perspectives. I think I, I would encourage us to do more collaborative work and more interdisciplinary work that can talk because I think oral history is a powerful tool to communicate. If you can take the voices of Sikh women or the voices of um, Hindu women or whatever that, that are speaking with LDS or Mormon women, you've got something that, that, that can allow some dialogue. Um, I was just, uh, there was a scene in a movie that I was watching that was set in Mumbai and a, a, there was an, a, an Islamic attack and a Sikh man was, would, just took a minute to explain his background to a woman who was very fearful of him. And um, I think if we just sit back and allow the everyday stories that are gathered in oral histories to talk to each other, that's a powerful tool. I think also um, something to pick up on what Laurie was saying is this idea of LDS history specifically and the ways in which it can inform the present and should inform the present. I'm not a member and when I first started studying the church and church members, I was fascinated by how much members love their own history and are invested in their own history. And that is true for many religious groups, but I think it takes a different sort of a feeling or atmosphere um, for LDS members. And I was fascinated by that and almost fascinated by the study of those who are studying their own religious history. I don't know, it's kind of layers of complexity to it, but it's fascinating to look at how do people tell their own history and what does what they say about their own history tell us about them now in the present. What kind of things are you seeing from that? I mean, you're being, you're energized by that energy yeah. getting back, but as, as an outsider looking in, what are you seeing? What's driving that? And, and what are yeah. some of the specific Well, it's like Laurie seeing? said with regards to, you know, the narrative of the American pioneers, and it's tied into these great American themes, but ultimately that story, which is partially a myth, really, when we look at the idea of global Mormonism, uh, it, it excludes, you know, and what is it doing? What purpose does that story tell? Well, it, it makes the church an American faith. It supports certain American principles, which are important for civic society and for Mormonism engagement with the civic society and so you can see that that story serves particular functions um, with regards to the association between Mormonism and Americanism but how that is not a useful function when you take the church outside of the US is really interesting and how in fact it can be counterproductive. Let's talk about some of the ways that it can be. Uh, Tana Lynn I'll, I'll address that to you. You've done work on Latter-day Saints in India. Have you seen that this idea that Latter-day Saints will say it's wonderful. You can go anywhere in the world and go to a Latter-day Saint meeting and you'll all be saying the same things and having the same lesson and having the same church experience. Let's, let's hear about that. Yeah, I think I have to point to Colleen's work on this in her chapter on converts. Um, she nails this, that the idea that we're, many of us in the West, as we study Mormon studies, was like, oh, we are not in culturating, we're not changing as we move, right? Well, a lot of the converts from the global south are drawn to the tradition because it's got a global identity, because uh, congregations are so mixed and there, there's all sorts of different populations and trying to find a dominant culture is problematic. So I've seen, especially in my work in India, I've seen um, Latter-day Saints utilize the term gospel culture as a resource to actually take endogamous, or non-endogamous cast marriages, like two different castes or people from different parts of the country and bring them together and say, we do, we do gospel culture in our home rather than anything else. Whatever gospel culture is, right? I mean, the whole idea of identifying that is, is fraught. But, um, but there is something about this imagined Zion community globalized thing that is an, is an appeal 
so, yeah. Yeah, I, I absolutely ag agree with everything you're saying, Tonal, and I think there's another side to it, though, too, which is that sometimes it works, it's counterproductive. Yeah. Um, that there are p you know, church members who are drawn to sort of the gospel principles, but the enactment of those, it's sometimes the enactment of those principles in other places that um, shows the Americanness, right, of oh, yeah. certain, we have certain ways of, of defining um, yeah. You know what it means to sort of you go to church for two hours. There's sort of a standard standardization that doesn't work very well right. in a lot of places, and so there are people who have adapted in often very creative ways. For example, um, I'll just mention um, your sister, Stacey Lynn Ford's work on women domestic workers in Hong Kong, who have joined the Mormon Church and are in wards there. These are people whose families are often back in the Philippines or in other parts of Asia. They've migrated to get labor, to work in Hong Kong. They're living in what are sort of near slave-like conditions often. They're living with families. They aren't allowed out of the house uh, very often. They're working 24-7 for most of the week. Some of them sleep on the floors of the children's rooms. They're taking care of the children or they sleep in the bathtubs as she described, it's, it's, it's difficult, difficult conditions. But these are women who go to church on Sundays and they spend the day there. They bring, bring everything for the day because they can have a meal together, they can have, it's their one time of the week um, to have fellowship. And they don't have families close by, They're, they sometimes get home. But so then it, it makes you stop and think, well what does the whole idea of family mean? in this context? How does it work? How do we understand the function of the church? The church has to work very differently. So there are ways um, in which that's both a frustration and a, sort of an opportunity for adapting certain things that um, are, need to be, or you know, ne in certain circumstances, need to be adapted. Yeah, I, I spoke with Colleen about this on, on the Maxwell Institute podcast, this idea that American feminism doesn't always translate well um, in other countries. Let's, let's talk about that a little bit, about some of the concerns that face um, usually typically white American, and, and American feminism has a very white history to it as well. It's, uh, it's, it's changing now, but let's talk about how views through a feminist lens in the United States don't always resonate with women in other countries when it comes to Latter-day Saints in particular. Um, does anyone want to begin on that? Everyone wants to hear Hazel's voice. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, please. <laughs> uh, well, definitely I think in a European context, a little bit like Colleen was saying earlier, that feminism can be a dirty word. Uh, and I think that's, that's really interesting. It's fascinating to think about why that might be. Um, I think it might be because on one hand, you have a narrative that feminism has achieved its goals and so therefore we don't need it anymore, supposedly. And then on the other, uh, an idea that, well, feminism actually gave uh, the world a lot of things, but they might not necessarily have been useful. And so we should reject it because actually feminism was never a good thing in the first place. And, and both of those two perspectives combine to lead to a situation where people are reluctant to identify with feminism, even if they themselves, it appears to me, are stone-cold feminists. So uh, I've had this a lot in relation to Mormon women where I speak to them about the word feminist and they will reject it. They'll say, I'm not a feminist. But I believe in social justice. I believe in fairness. I believe in equality. I believe that in all levels of all structures, including within the church. And so I'm really fascinated by this contradiction where everything that they're saying and doing is inherently feminist, but they won't use that word to describe themselves. And I think we have to be careful then that we might simplistically look at the likes of survey research where you, know, you might get asked a question like, do you identify as a feminist? And somebody ticks the box, no, and we move on. And then we then say stuff like, well, you know, 70% of this Mormon sample said that they weren't feminist. But that doesn't really get to the heart of the issue because when you do in-depth interviews with people, you'll find out that they are very committed to feminist goals. They just use a different language to describe it. Uh, and I think in the States, perhaps, the label Mormon feminist has very particular political uh, meanings behind it in a way that doesn't operate the same in other contexts. But that doesn't mean that the principles behind it aren't still relevant for women outside of the US, or they're not engaging with that. But they're definitely using a different form of language to try to articulate how they feel about things. And Melissa Inouye has written about some of the pressures and experiences of, of women in other countries that, that 
you know, they're not American, they didn't grow up with these same sort of sensibilities. If you were to take some of the feminist concerns that come out and, and present them there, it, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't land. Uh, Tunnelin, maybe you have something to say about that, yeah. like some of these domestic workers that we're talking about. Well, well, first and foremost, I want to shout out to Melissa Inouye, who I should be here in my place right now. And her voice is so crucial. We all need to pray to keep that voice alive right now. Um, she has a book that was just written and published by Deseret Book in the Religious Studies, um, at her Crossings book. And there's a chapter in there where she talks about... And the about, Maxwell Institute. And the Maxwell Institute. I'm so sorry. Available now Product on Amazon placement. and Deseret Bookstores. No, but really, it is so important. It is so important. And the way, the, the way she's addressing n using feminist work to talk to the general public in ways that, that are very palatable and very helpful. Um, but I would also add that we think that the United States is the only place, or the, it's the only place where there's a women's movement. There's a, clearly a women's movement in India and has been for years and years. And the women that I interview there are very aware of that. They never use the word patriarchy in a positive light. It was always very pejorative. They were trained. The word itself has the a word history? Itself. That, okay. Yes, yes, absolutely. It's very, we, we, we have a patriarchal society that we're fighting against. And it's the priesthood that actually liberates us. So I see Elizabeth Brusco's work confirmed all over the place that in the global south, as women have been drawn to religions that stress morals and families and and who that control their husbands and and their machismo right um, that they're actually liberated that it's a more effective tool that evangelical religions are more effective than feminism right to liberating women um, and I think a lot of women in the global south will articulate that with the caveat I'm not seeking for priesthood I don't want you know, I'm not trying to fight here, but absolutely. And, and they'll use, I've talked about using the handbook um, as a tool of liberation too, when women will say, well, my priesthood leader wasn't allowing me to do what I was supposed to do, and I showed them the handbook and boom, I was liberated and able to do my job, right? <laughs> um, let's, let's, let's keep kind of going down this road. For, for example, the ideal woman. Let's picture the ideal woman. And, and religious communities will often talk about what an ideal woman of God would be, the qualities. And they, you can go back to Psalms and read the little characteristics that the Hebrew Bible lays out. Um, but how that plays out in different cultural contexts uh, is, is usually more complicated. And a, and a church that's trying to be global, like the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, runs into difficulties because depending on which context, you could be way more progressive than the host culture, or you could s or be in tension with where the host culture is. So let's talk about that a little bit in terms of women, in terms of what the ideal woman is. Lori, do you want to start on that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, big question. Um, I and mean, you've, you've sort of encapsulated the, the problem right there um, when you are trying to globalize and this to, you know, to distill it, when you're trying to uh, correlate and globalize and standardize, um, how do you account for and adapt or not adapt to local you know, cultures? And there, you know, we're, we're telling lots of anecdotes in part because there is no one story to the, even calling it a global church, it, I mean, or global Mormonism as opposed to American Mormonism, or I'm not sure what the opposition is. It always, I always sort of bristle at that because there is no one global Mormonism, right? There are many, many different kinds of contexts. And as Tonalyn has just said, there are lots of places in the global south, in Africa and in, in Latin America in particular, where what women that I've talked to want more than anything else is a nuclear family and is a situation where they can stay home with their children. It's a deeply, con what we would see as a deeply conservative, probably more in keeping with the traditional Mormon family norm. Um, whereas in, in Europe, in New Zealand, in Australia, they sort of um, bristle against the sense that women, well, of course we want to work. Of course we want to be outside the home. We don't have to fight the feminist battles because we're already equal. 
um, or you know that those just aren't our you know our concerns. So um, you know it's it's a challenge to uh, you know what do you do? I mean I, I as much as I you know I'm I'm a non non church member as well, but. Uh, so I don't think much about whether I need to sympathize with the, ch the, the church leaders or not, but it's a tough issue, right? What are you supposed to do in this situation and how much conformity do you need in that environment? I think, I just want to tag one other thing um, that uh, Tan Lin, I guess it was, pointed out, maybe Hazel mentioned it too, is that the church is not only global, um, because to me, sort of global can conjure up these images of, well, we have, you know, uh, Scandinavians in Scandinavia and British people in Great Britain and Africans in Africa and we can celebrate all that in some way within this one church structure. No, the, 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 the reality of it is that we have migrants from Africa in Sweden and we have these transnational domestic workers in Hong Kong and we have these trans transnational sites that are sort of trying to meld um, ward life or you know, trying to meld it into one thing, whereas you're bringing to it so many different kinds of experiences. So I guess I'm just you know, diagnosing the problem like Blair is more than I'm answering it. I can't answer how you do that. Um, but it's a tough row and I think that you know, I've seen how the church, you know, sometimes slowly, but is, is worried about this and legitimately is thinking about, well, should we have some hymns in Spanish, perhaps? Or, you know, the new, the new um, you know, attempt to change the hymn book, I think, is a very concrete example of, you know, thinking about questions of diversity and what that's going to mean. And it happens within um, religious ideas and doctrines, like there are tensions and different things that happen in different cultures. Hazel, one of the things uh, I thought you might talk about are the political and economic considerations. Religion doesn't exist as this thing apart from everything else. In all of these global contexts, these diverse global contexts, there are different political and economic situations that women are dealing with. Maybe you can talk a little bit about that. Yeah, and I'm glad that Laurie mentioned the fact that when we talk about global, we don't just mean, you know, the Swedish people in Sweden and so on and so forth. That's that we like, have I call that the it's a small world yeah. version of, like, you know, you go through each country <laughs> and everything's perfectly demarcated. Exactly. You know, oh, we're now entering Ireland. Yeah, Very cool. where they there's only Canada. Irish people, apparently. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Uh, the congregations that I've worked with have been very multinational um, and that has been a really interesting dynamic of when we speak about Irish LDS, you know, who are we speaking about, you know, what language are we using, you know, if you're a Filipino attending church in Ireland every day, are you Irish uh, or what is the, the meaning behind that, I think that's fascinating and in terms of the, the political and economic differences then I think you start to see a whole other um, layer, I guess, to people's considerations of what is ideal womanhood too. You know, particularly with the Filipino community, many of them in Ireland work in elder care, they work in nursing homes, and they're working night shifts, they're working weekends, many of them aren't available to come to church on Sundays, they are trying to practice their faith around a timetable that a stereotypical church doesn't necessarily allow for. And I feel as though, although the church authorities say stuff like, well, you know, work outside the home if you need to, it's kind of almost like a platitude. The ideal of you should be full-time within the home, you should be attending church every Sunday, is still there, irregardless of the economic imperatives for many members in the States and across the globe. Uh, and it's that, how do we come to an understanding of the diversity of people's experiences, that everybody has different pressures on their lives that are going to intersect with their religious practice, and how do we accommodate that uh, and not judge them for it, not think that they're lesser LDS because they have to work on Sunday or because their white shirt is in the wash or, you know. How do we accommodate that and just reflect that that's just the reality of people's messy, complex, diverse lives, and it still makes them good LDS, they're still committed members uh, and really truly believe that. I think that's really the challenge. And One of the instances that really brought this home to me in Ireland was in relation to a recent referendum that we had in 2015 on the question of whether or not we should legalise same-sex marriage. And we had to have a referendum about it because it'd been, it had been inserted into the Constitution um, years previously, or at least courts had interpreted it, the Constitution to mean that marriage was between one man and one woman. And so we all had to go off and have our little vote about whether or not we felt that um, we should legalise same-sex marriage. I think Ireland was the first 
country in the world to legalise same-sex marriage this way through referendum rather than through legislation, through the parliament. Um, and Ireland did vote in favour, I think it was 70-something percent voted in favour of it, but I was doing my field work with Irish Mormons around about that time and it was in that stage where I think there may have been similar debates in the States with regards to maybe California and the church had come out quite publicly with regards to their opinion on that issue. And of course Irish and Mormons were reading and watching what church authorities were saying and they were really grappling with these ideas of what I should do with regards to my Irish identity, with regards to my Mormon identity. And many of them, most of them told me that they were going to vote yes for same-sex marriage. Um, and they were quite clear in terms of their own justification for that. They were saying, I have to go with my gut, I have to go with my heart, I have to go with what I think is right. Um, but it was fascinating for me as a non-member to sit back on the outside and kind of analyse what's going on there. In essence, what they were being asked to do was kind of make a choice between their religious faith and their, I guess, their social identity as an Irish person. I think we forget sometimes when we talk about religious minorities across the globe that they're not separate from the societies that they live within. You know, they don't live in a hut somewhere under the ground. You know, they, they work in these communities, they parent in these communities, they volunteer in these communities. You know, if you take the Irish example, they are Irish. And so they have been affected by Irish societal norms in the same way that all other Irish have been. And in Ireland, it seems, a societal norm was that gay people should have the right to marry. And it seemed as though Irish Mormons had imbued those values and were enacting those values in the ballot box, despite the fact that they knew they were going against the guidance of their church. And it's fascinating to see how, in a global context, people have to do those sorts of political negotiations all the time. What's right for me? Do I uh, adhere to my national identity or my social identity or my religious identity? And I hate that people have to make that choice. You know, why can't they... Uh, be a committed LDS who just happens to believe that same-sex marriage should be something that uh, can be legal in a country. It seems in Ireland that they felt that they wanted to be able to express that, but that maybe the global church doesn't necessarily allow for that kind of complexity. And that tension doesn't just exist with contemporary issues like, like same-sex marriage. It also um, happens when Latter-day Saints employ history in certain ways. So Latter-day Saints have particular stories that they retell that you'll see in church curriculum or that you'll see through church film productions and things like this. So for example, pioneers going across the plains, Laura, you, you mentioned this. This is a very uh, prominent part of my Latter-day Saint upbringing. You know, we would celebrate the holiday every July. It was like having two Fourth of Julys. It was awesome. Uh, you know, we'd have an extra parade and all of this. But I can't imagine sitting in, in a meeting in India and hearing someone stand up and talk about someone pulling a handcart. Tonalyn, do you want to talk about how uh, history kind of has And that's where you're wrong, tensions? Okay, actually. Good. <laughs> <laughs> um, I wish I had my slides with me, but there's some amazing pictures. Actually, the stake that I studied had a, a tradition. It was Pioneer's Day. And um, they were very sensitive to the fact that they are pioneers, that each of them are pioneers. And they would utilize that identity to talk about how we are going through, we're having to leave our family, um, in facing very difficult opposition like the pioneers did, right? So there's a, a picture of, actually they constructed a hand cart. It was a huge hand cart that fit several people on it that they were pulling. There's, they were square dancing, which is, is really not okay. It's a very Indian thing. Right? Did they, was it more... Bollywood type square dance? There, there was no screw okay. in the light bulb. It was it was solid. They had learned this from hmm. from missionaries years years back. But there was also there's a picture of them actually taking ice blocks onto the basketball court, which they don't use because they're waiting for the cricket pitch to be put in, right? But they would walk across this ice. Each of them would take off their shoes and walk across the ice. And then they went inside afterwards, and John Morala, who was one of the pioneer members, one of the first baptized in the stake, he talked about how each of us are pioneers, right? So that is infused. They, and it is, it's, I charted it three years in a row, and it's continued to be part of their stake identity. Do you think they'll get to a point where, what was the person's name, John? John Morala. Yeah, will, will there get to a point where they reenact John 
<laughs> what would they reenact? Him reenacting? I don't know. Well, but he and in his other words, family well, the story of 28 changed. who were all baptized, yeah. right? I mean, that's the idea, right? It, that as we do the history and involve people in making their own history, that can become part of their own identity, their, their narrative. Of so that identity. takes time to build those. Uh, right? I mean, we, we've got a lot of people here from the church history department that, that are very much working on that. I would point to the global histories that are on LDS.org. There's fantastic work there. That what other ways is the church going about this? It seems like it is important to the church to not just have this one particular narrative of, of Mormon pioneers going across the plains, but they're making real efforts to try to broaden these stories out. Absolutely. Yeah. There, I mean, there's lots of initiatives. I'm probably not the one that should talk about it, but, but I, I was in a panel at MHA where people were calling out the church history department, and the, the people were actually kind of clueless of what was really going on in the church history department. There's a, a tremendous efforts to do that, to globalize, to localize, and um, to gather oral histories and whatnot. Yeah, I want to go back to the pioneers for a minute um, because I've seen the same pictures and things that that Tonalyn has, and it's kind of amazing to see these, you know, South Asian Indians with cotton beards uh, on, you know, <laughs> prairie skirts. Um, that said, I think it's really uh, the other piece of this though that's really important to point out is the ways in which, I mean, there are a lot of Native peoples who are Mormon as well. And that image plays very, very differently um, in Native American communities. The idea, the whole trope of the pioneers and frontiers people, that those are images that are not, that, that are sort of filled with memories of displacement and violence. And I'm not saying this to, you know, just to lay guilt into this, but it's important to see the ways in which that history doesn't always um, resound or, or translate easily into, oh, it's wonderful, we're all going, we're pioneers going to Zion. It's also important as a historian, I actually just did this the other day, I was thinking, I wonder when the terms pioneers and frontier started to be used in a Mormon context. I don't have the answer to that yet because I didn't have time to do the research, but I did do an engram, you know, you can go on Google and see the usage of certain words. And the word pioneers is something that came very late to the game, not necessary again, not necessarily in the Mormon context, although in, in the U.S. context more broadly, it's not until the closing of the frontier in the 1880s and 1890s, that that term starts to come into common usage in, in texts and other kinds of printed sources. And it sort of drops down after Daniel Boone, I think in the 1940s and 50s, and then it drops off precipitously. So that has a history, that, that terminology, and it's a history that doesn't play the same way in a variety of places, and is, I think, really problematic in Utah in particular. So. Another area where history doesn't play in the same way, Lori, I'll direct this to you again. Um, some of the difficult aspects of church history, you, you mentioned Indian, uh, Native American, American Indian displacement as one example. Another one would be reckoning with um, uh, the 19, up until 1978, um, Latter-day Saint women couldn't participate in the highest ordinances uh, of the LDS church, or of the Church of Jesus Christ, and men were not ordained to the priesthood if they were of African descent. So. Uh, in an American context, you have African Americans, uh, black people in America that hear that story and it's, it's difficult, it's painful, uh, it's something to reckon with. Um, and on a more global scale, how have you seen that history being reckoned with? Yeah, I have a, a good story about that. In fact, um, I, I think it's always important to recognize that African Americans do not have the same history that, other, that Africans do. That they are not the I mean, even if theologically they are placed in uh, you know, a, a similar kind of lineage, their social context, their, politi their politics, their economics, their histories are completely different. And so I was, and I, you know, I, I keep having to be reminded of this myself, even as a historian who studies these things. So um, I was in, I went to Ghana last um, December and met with actually focus groups of young um, African Latter-day Saints. Uh, who were studying in the seminary there, and some of them are doing, you know, remote degrees at BYU Idaho, and and are getting an education through the, with the help of the church, and I um, I spent a couple hours with this one group, and I kept kind of pushing on this issue. I wanted to to talk about these were they were all young, they were under you know 30, 
um, which to me, the older I get, the, you know, the more that age will go up, I'm sure. But um, they, they were, um, I kept saying, well, what about, you know, what was your impression of the missionaries? Is it, what did you, what, what did you think of these sort of all white people showing up in there with their name badges and in the fancy cars and with the big fancy temple behind the gates? And um, I, you know, I was sort of prodding them because I wondered, do they have this, what is their relationship to this priesthood ban? And finally, um, you know, none of them were biting at all. And finally, um, you know, the, the, it was clear that they're focused forward. All these young people in Africa are, you know, they weren't born then. For them, it's ancient history, even if they know it. But finally, this one guy said to me, you know, that's your problem in the United States. That's not our problem. You know, we have lots of other problems, but that's not one of them. And they don't see, apparently, they don't see the church um, because, you know, like other American churches, it has given up its racial restrictions. I mean, there were other churches that had racial restrictions. So seen from the perspective of a rising generation of uh, West Africans, the priesthood ban is not there as an issue. Now, that's not to say it's not really important in some quarters, but that's not the place to look, I think, for a kind of interest in um, sort of how that came about. Nonetheless, it's an important history, I think, to, to uh, yeah, I think be even honest the, about. The way that religion is experienced by people in those contexts differs. So right. um, black members in the United States are in a clear minority in the church, and so the pressures that they experience at church are going to be different than what someone in a West African congregation might face, right? Oh, absolutely. I mean, the, you know, the biggest problems um, of people that I talk to in West Africa are just basic issues of economic sustenance and poverty. Um, they and many of them, I, several of them, use the term. Um, I was looking for greener pastures, which I guess you can take as both a sort of in a scriptural sense, but in an economic sense as well. That the church offers people real opportunities there that they can't get elsewhere for women as well as for men. In fact, more for women. I would say that the the opportunities for literacy through church programs there are um, there are more women taking advantage of those now than men. Um, by and large, and women see the value of being able uh, to access the, the resources that church membership can offer. In 15 minutes, we're going to open it up for 15 minutes of questions. Uh, before we get to that, the last subject that I wanted to cover is some of the logistics of doing women's history in a global context. So there are some people in attendance today that are um, working on degrees or thinking about working on degrees. So I thought it would be helpful and useful to talk about some of the triumphs. I want to hear some triumphs, some good stories and experiences. And I want to hear some wish list items, some things that you uh, think are outstanding yet to be completed or yet to be started. So. Um, who wants to start with that? You can start with a triumph. You can start with something for a wish list, uh, whatever you'd like. Who, Tonalyn, why don't, why don't you start? Um, so I would say that one of the huge triumphs is um, Laurel Thatcher Ulrich's good friend, Claudia Bushman, who started the Mormon Women's Oral History Project at Claremont. And that has changed the way I have perceived and done my work. It created my, my tool for my dissertation. And um, I think that's one of the great triumphs is the growing number of um, archives and oral history projects. And, and they should continue and proliferate, and, um, and they will. But like I said, the Claremont Oral History Project is continuing as the global Mormon history project. Um, and you can look at, I'm just going to give you some resources here. Um, if you go to mormonstudies.cgu.edu slash go global slash, okay? Um, one more time, mormonstudies.cgu.edu slash global slash, or just Google. There's um, a great page that gives you some resources. Another really important triumph is of the brainchild of Melissa Inouye and, and others who have started the Global Mormon Studies um, Initiative, or no, it, this, these guys you can find at globalmormonstudies.org. And it's the Global Mormon Studies Network. 
and you can be a part of that network. I encourage anyone who has a slight interest in this to get there. Anyone who meets anyone anywhere in the global church or in diaspora here in the United States who has any interest whatsoever, get them to these sites to just become part of the conversation. I think that's what we, that's one of our things that we have not succeeded at, is being able to nurture the next generation. And Melissa in her book talks about Confucian relationships, right? How we all have the someone that's our superior, that's our teacher, and those that we nurture. And we need to continue to do that. I feel like in my life, I have become, in my scholarly life, I'm becoming more of a connective tissue for people. My, I'm using my degree as a connective tissue to, to connect people in India who are not necessarily scholars to this project. Vina Chindram is a great example of this. She's one that came to me and said, I, I'm interested in what you're doing, right? And the next thing you know, she, here she is doing all sorts of amazing things in um, this work. So uh, the, the resources are out there. This is a growing field. Yeah. What are some takeaways from those oral histories? Like what, what becomes of that work? So this is basically researchers oh. are going and talking to people about their experiences. Well, it, you know, Claudia Bushman would say we're spinning straw into gold which is exactly what we're doing. We're creating the next archives. Um, and those, they, they're powerful when you hear those narratives. When I can say what, and, and this is wrong, <laughs> but there's times where we want to be able to communicate something and someone has said it far better than we can. And when that voice can be used, that's where the power is, and that's where movement can happen. Thank you, Tunnel and Rutherford. Hazel O'Brien, how about you? Triumphs, wish list items? Um, I think definitely in terms of triumphs, a little bit like what Anne was saying earlier on about the need to put women at the center of American religious history, and until that happens, you don't really have an American religious history. That's obviously true of all history and all disciplines. And I think I've been really encouraged to see that that is starting to happen now in many disciplines. With regards to history, you can see it in Ireland, there had been very male-centered narratives about Irish history, which are now being not rectified, but certainly added to by female voices, people like Professor Linda Connolly in Maynooth University. And that's so encouraging for young generations of female historians who are coming up through the ranks to see that there are voices there that are respected, who have an authoritative voice that is listened to. Uh, that gives them the encouragement to keep going, to think that I can do that. It goes back to that basic idea of you can't be what you can't see. And so the fact that we now see women in these important roles in academia and in activism in Ireland is really inspiring, I think, for young Irish women. And it holds true in a global Mormon studies context too, because I was thinking about this over the last few days, that uh, much of the global Mormon studies um, I guess not a resurgence necessarily, but a, a focus in recent years, has been female-led. If you think about these ladies right here, if you think about the likes of Caroline Klein, if you think about our wonderful Melissa. When I read Melissa's work, it was just transformative. I read The Oak and the Banyan Tree, and it literally made my PhD come together. I mean, she just is incredible. And that those women are doing this work on Mormon studies is changing the face of the church. It's changing the face of the study of Mormonism as a culture. And I think that's just incredible. And I'm really excited now that I'm here. I don't think I would be here if they had not done that, if they hadn't laid that path for me. It's just incredible. What was your work that the Oak and the Banyan Tree inspired? Oh, it was it, just fascinating to see how much this concept of the Banyan Tree as being a tree with many roots but one base uh, was used by her as a metaphor to talk about the modern LDS church, to say that there is perhaps a, a fear as Mormonism moves further and further away from the center of Utah, that it might lose its core self. And she, in essence, argues that if you compare uh, the oak and the banyan tree, they're both strong, they're both sturdy, they're both able to withstand the pressures of life. They're both going to grow in the future, but they have very different root systems. The oak is just one root, one tree. The banyan tree has many roots, which are all ultimately 
back to a core strength that allows it to continue. And when I understood that metaphor, I was like, yes, that's the sort of idea that I'm trying to get across when I talk about how Mormonism uh, is different in Europe than it is in the US, but that doesn't mean that it's any less important or interesting or worthy of study or that those members are any less committed. It was transformative for me. Thank you. That's Hazel O'Brien. Laurie Maffley Kipp, uh, triumphs, wish list items. Let's see. Where well, to begin? I, I, so uh, I just uh, I want to start by piggybacking on Tana Lynn's point about oral histories and and point out how much um, the church history has already done and the church history library has on hand. So I it's um, I think we've we've been emphasizing sort of the newer kinds of developments, right. but there are enormous amounts of materials already available sitting, you know, sitting somewhere on a shelf at a library near you um, that, I mean, Colleen mentioned it. If, if you know, if you've studied in any other fields, it's much harder to gather information. In some ways, there's a centralization to sources here, which on the one hand, we have to, you know, we need to keep pushing those boundaries and making sure we're hearing all those voices outside of the central place. On the other hand, there's a lot that's already here that's been collected. Um, and sometimes it's just a matter of seeing it through different eyes or reading against the grain, as they might say, reading it differently. But uh, between the University of Utah, the Eileen Clyde collection there, there's real growth in interest in women's experiences, both here and globally, uh, that one can access today. Um, even as the work needs to continue. But I would say, um, you know, my first thought was anything outside the U.S. or anything that equates Mormonism with the U.S. Uh, or U.S. history. But um, more specifically, I think this, I, I'm just more and more convinced that this phenomenon of, um, of movement into the United States, so there are many, many um, immigrant communities today in the U.S., um, Mauritius, from Mauritius, from, uh, you know, from, from Haiti, uh, from all kinds of places, that where Mormon wards are trying to figure out what it means to be Mormon and to be American, but still to retain ties and roots and connections to a very different kind of culture. So lots of, lots of work to be done there. Um, work on uh, women who fit, don't fit quite inside the, the normative American family, um, single women, single women missionaries, uh, but single women in all kinds of places, the roles that they've played, single mothers, um, you know, different kinds of family arrangements. There's just a lot to be done, I think, um, in terms of women's history uh, in the Mormon church. I can't do it all, but I'm, I'm, one of the exciting things about this week is just seeing the, the sort of range of talents out there, of uh, people who are um, really trying to start some of that work. Yeah, oh, please tunnel in. I just have to say, give a plug for studying various Mormonisms as well, as we were talking about the woman who was painting, and I, there's a woman in the Bicker Tonight branch of the Restoration who is receiving the hymns of Zion, and it's a very much a gift that she is, is involved in. These, these kinds of things that, that cross not only um, global barriers, but also inter religious barriers and, and intra-religious barriers, too. All right. Rutherford, Hazel O'Brien, and Laurie Maffley-Kipp will open it up now for questions. Let's have a hand for them, please. Thank you. 